had some new people, and so um, I don't know you. I've met the other others, so if you could just uh, tell me your name. So I see your name on the thing, but just tell me a little bit of, about yourself and what brought you here today, or about today, but the decided to come to the RCI. Mm -hmm. And how many classes have you been to? I have like four or five four. maybe. Okay, that tells you how long it's been since I've been. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have Lynn Dan. Lynn Dan. Dan's brand new. Hey Dan. I'm Tim. I've been shared the last, same last name, so <laughs> that's good. That's awesome. Um, just a, um, just a, a little update. So I've, I've been gone for a while, and I'd like to share, share a little bit. I told most people know that I became Catholic myself back in uh, 1990 um, and I went to seminary shortly after that and spent most of those years in the seminary. Um, I was going to, my biggest struggle wasn't at the time was whether I was going to be a diocesan priest or a Benedictine monk and um, when the bishop found out I was going to be a monk he was sort of sad because he spent all this money on the, in the seminary for me to go to seminary and he threatened people after that not to send them to the Benedictine seminary. <laughs> Um, and then I recently got married. I moved to Wichita three years ago. Um, got married last September. Um, found this parish. This parish, I really love this, this parish. This has been my favorite parish so far in Wichita. Um, I like, uh, I like Father. He's a, a good homilist and, uh, I like listening to him in the morning, the St. Joseph thing. So, uh, it's, um, I think he, it's a good parish. I like it a lot. And um, so I, I asked Father last year if I could help teach RCIA. I used to run an RCI program in Shreveport. And, um, and I, missed, I missed it so much that I felt like I really just wanted to help out. Um, so I've been in these seats similar to this um, many of a long time. Because how long is 1991? 30-something years. So it's... It does. It seems like yesterday that I um, was confirmed, and I still remember. I still have the video of it, and I had hair, but big old hair. So, um, but I wanted I wanted to share a little bit about me and where I've been. Um, and so here I'm back in Kansas. I was actually born in Kansas, and left. My parents were in the military, so we traveled around. And I lived in Louisiana the longest. Um, <coughs> and everything's Catholic there. Everything you do is Catholic. There, the names of food, restaurants, we don't have counties, we have parishes, and most of the parishes are named after saints, so, um, so it's pretty different coming back to, a, back to Kansas, and the food's planned here, but I have to get used to that. Um, but tonight's topic, uh, this week and next week is the commandments, and I'm doing the first three, and um, the first three are primarily commandments about about God and where the rest of the commandments are the, like divided up. And I had an email, this is from an email um, from a website and I'd sent it, I was going to, hoping to be able to get it to y'all but I don't have your guys' email addresses so I forwarded it to... Hey, can we start with the prayer? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks Tim. All right, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let's, let's do the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. And is there a, a really good St. Joseph's prayer that you know, Father? Of hand, um, not with me. Since, okay, since this was the, the year of St. Joseph. So this, I meant to send this to you guys, because I, but I like again, I don't have your email address, and Sonia couldn't figure out how to send it to you guys on her phone. So I wanted you to have a copy of this. Um, I didn't, we didn't want to print it because of copyright rules, and I didn't know. Um, but I will make sure that we, but Sonia could still forward. I'll send it, it to, it to you, you tonight. Tonight, and you guys can read over it. Um, but it's by Peter Kraft, and um, he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, and all this stuff here, so. What exactly is the Knights of Columbus? So Knights of Columbus is a men's organization, um, and they do a lot, a lot of different charity works. Uh, Knights of Columbus in this parish do, um, well that's the men's club that does the Christmas trees and the, mm -hmm. and the hams. 
Lance of Columbus helps make a, it's a men's group. It's a, it's a way for men to get together and to commemorate. They have different charities that raise money. It's, um, for people who know what the Masons are, it's like that, only it's just Catholic based and it's, it's and it supports the church instead of against the church. They promote vocations, um, support vocations, things like yeah. that. Yeah, charity is like yeah. uh, kids with um, mental, mm -hmm. I don't know what it's called. Uh, Dis mental, disabilities. Yeah, mental disabilities and stuff like, mm -hmm. and yeah, just handicaps. We wish we um, when I was at Lancaster Columbus in Shreveport, we went to people's homes and helped painted their houses and stuff too, and yeah. um, delivered food. And when I was in the seminary, they would give me like three hundred dollars every month to help because you know you're not making any money. So they so they help sponsor seminaries and stuff like that. Um, they sell tutu rolls sometimes, different stores. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to go over the first three commandments. So talking, um, it's hard for me to talk through this, um, so I'm just going to um, have, if someone wants to volunteer to read the first section. I'll do it. Okay. One of the Ten Commandments. Talking about them is pointless if we do not know them, and few people can list all ten. For many generations, most <laughs> Christians knew them from memory. Today, it is still illegal in America to even display them in public schools. So we had better begin by simply listing them word for word as the Bible records them in Exodus uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. <coughs> Excuse me. You, shall, you shall not make for yourself a graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water beneath the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Thank you. That you should not take the name of the Lord God in vain, for the Lord your God will hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Six days I shall labor and you should do work, but on the seventh day on this you shall rest. So this is where I wanted to stop because um, one of the reasons why Catholics are obligated to go to Mass is because of the third commandment, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. And I've got something that I pulled up on here that I wanted to read that I didn't get a chance to. Uh, it says here, the church teaches that you have an obligation to go to Mass every Sunday. The Mass is a celebration of the Eucharist or the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Many people do not understand why the church requires Mass every Sunday. The answer is found within the Ten Commandments, um, basically the, the third one. And so the commandments... Um, like in the, we're going to go over one through three primarily today. Danny will do the rest. But the first three are what they call, or what a lot of people call the God Commandments, um, where, they, where they center around what we do for God, giving back to God. And then the others are more like what we do not do for other people, or what people, some people call family commandments. Is there any other name, Father, that you would call them? Is that family? Okay. Um, so Danny's gonna Danny's gonna go over the other seven. So if he'll have a, a bigger bigger chore, and, um, but so again, so people, a lot of people they want to know because when people come from other religions, they're you're not obligated to go every Sunday. You just sort of go whenever you feel like it. And when you become Catholic, you realize that there's an obligation that you you've got to go to mass, and that's because we, that's how we are fulfilling one of the commandments. Is that how do we keep the seventh day holy? And by giving God some time, taking up space. Does anyone have any questions about that? I know it was um, with me growing up Lutheran. My mom just took me to church whenever she just felt like it. If we had to miss a Sunday for a particular reason, it, in becoming Catholic, that was it was a different. You, you felt like you had to go. And currently, right now, because of the pandemic, I, um, I don't know how. <coughs> Father, maybe you could explain this better. It's been the obligation has been lifted. Um, 
and it's, it's up to the bishop, right, for mm -hmm. when that obligation gets lifted. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's going to transition with people, because um, some people will undoubtedly still be unwilling to go. I don't know how that's going to play out. Um, so, let's see. Tim, I would say that, you know, for, uh, for, for some non-Catholics too, though, growing up Mennonite, it was, there was a serious um, intent that we needed to go every single Sunday. And when we traveled, when we went, we didn't go on vacation very often, but when we went to like visit my um, aunts and uncles who lived in Colorado or in Dodge City, we would get up early in the morning and drive so that we could go to church with them, which meant when the, we went to Colorado, we were leaving at three in the morning so that we could get to my aunt's house so she could feed us breakfast so we could go to church with them and then we would have the meal and, and spend some time in the afternoon and then we would drive home because my dad had to be back to work on Monday. So it was, a, but it was very serious. We did not, we did not miss it. So I think we don't want to overgeneralize and, and because I think that for a lot of people, even if it isn't directed quite that way as, as it is in the Catholic Church, it still was a, a their understanding was that they needed to go every Sunday that was what the just that they owed back to God that they needed to be just in giving God his due and we did that by going to church I, I might add um, I've, I've been involved with this the uh, Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts here about the Sacrament for uh, quite a while and uh, you know when we go on camp out of town um, obviously it makes it a little bit of a challenge but um, personally for me I've really found uh, aside from that and then just traveling with my own family at times the, the opportunity to um, go to mass in other churches um, around our state or, or out of state for that matter uh, it's just a, an experience I really enjoy and, and it really uh, to me is a, a reaffirmment I think of, of how really uniform the faith is because you, you go to another church and you know the, the homily may be a little longer or maybe they all hold hands well before COVID they all hold hands during the Our Father you know little nuances that are different but uh, you know 95% of it's exactly the same as what you would have gone at home and you feel right. like you're connected now to these people in this community that you know it's just uh, I've always enjoyed that experience and enjoying enjoyed uh, um, seeing another church itself um, so for, for what that's worth yeah the pig tell on what you're saying Jesse I've been to countries where I don't understand the language but because the Catholic faith is the the celebration of mass is the same all over the world which is what Catholic means is universal it is the same so whether or not I understand the language I understand what is happening on that altar and um, it really is beautiful to go to different churches and experience the same thing, but different. Right. And I'm not Catholic, but I've been to several Catholic churches around the country, and I find it easier to go to a Catholic church being a guest than it is going to a Protestant church being a guest. It, there, there, for some reason, it seems like there's more, there's more focus. It, it, it's, you know, people come to a Catholic church, it's, like you said, uniform and stuff like that, yeah. and people are focused on you know, on um, what's going on. The Protestant church sometimes is more social. There's a more social aspect of it, so, you know, and you can feel uncomfortable in, in certain Protestant churches if you're a stranger. I, I, that's what I found. So. And, and it'll be different, though, for it, every... Yeah. Just right. not as a generalization, yeah. but yeah. No. Right. Okay. And that's the, let's, keep, uh, let's just keep on to this, <laughs> uh, the commandments, so I'm so sorry. sorry. Uh, no, that's okay. Okay, so the first command, I am the Lord your God, and you shall not have any strange gods before me. Um, so that's the commandment number one and um, I guess the best way to describe that is a lot of people here, here in the story that asked about was je uh, God is a jealous God you read that in the but I don't think that word is used jealous isn't used the same way in, the, in scriptures it's not like like when you have a you have a crush on someone and they, they see someone else and you feel jealous I don't that's not the kind of jealous I think God's talking about I think the scriptures is more talking about that you know it's it's futile these statues can't they can't help you they can't see you they can't touch you they can't do anything for you it may, it's 
pointless to worship idols. Um, and so that God, so the commandment number one is thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Um, number two, you shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Um, uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. People do it all the time. I mean, I mean, there's not a day goes by I'm not at work that I don't hear someone say something that's inappropriate about God. And it, and it, it sort of, it, it, if it pierces my heart, I can imagine how that feels towards um, other people. I was really, uh, um, and I'm sorry, I have to apologize. I just came from the dentist and my mouth has got blood in it. So just, <laughs> my mouth hurts. Um, Does anyone have any questions about um, the first two commandments? And so I just Are you going to expound on them more? Because if not, I got some more if you want me to. Yes, go ahead. So Is anything that you could do to help? Well, first of all, um, when looking at what does it mean by strange gods? What would you think on that? Like Greek gods and Okay, you got Greek gods and everything. So, I'm so sorry. No, just leave it right there. You're you're fine. I'll be fine like that. Thanks, Tim. What? Idols. So idols, uh, Greek gods, all of those things. So you have to remember too, as t Tim was explaining here, um, when when we were reading that part from the scriptures, where where did that come from? What book did it say? Exodus. Exodus. So in Exodus, where are they fleeing from? Egypt. Egypt. So Egypt was filled with all of these different gods. Matter of fact. The Nile River itself was a god for them. And so one of the um, ten plagues was turning the Nile and all the water into blood. Well, when you see blood, what do you think? Death. Death. Death to this god right here. That was the initial statement. The next plague, I won't run through all of them, but the next one was a plague of frogs everywhere. For the Egyptians, frogs was the fertility god. So if you wanted kids and you wanted to have, you were not to step on a frog. And so here they are tiptoeing around because there's frogs everywhere because they don't want to step on them. And so it really kind of begins to show really kind of how, uh, pardon the language, but impotent they became as they were kind of tiptoeing everywhere. Because now it's showing those things. Now, ultimately, Pharaoh was considered a god. And, the, um, and so when his firstborn son dies, it's showing forth that, no, no, you're not even a god. Now, so they leave from Egypt. We know that. And so God, though, wanting to make sure that, hey, there's no other things put before them, before him, after he has shown that, hey, all the gods of Egypt, they're not God. I am the one true God. And now, the thing is, um, we kind of don't learn this very well, to be honest. We, we struggle with this, because what would be some of our own gods? I would have, like, famous people or athletes. Or okay, we, we can put it that way. Possessions, things. Possessions, things, money. Activities. Activities? To where? Basically, it's this. This first, what did you say? I'm so sorry. I think my wife would say my uh, smartphone. Smartphone could be? <laughs> oh, yeah, do it. You're good. You're good. Do you want to plug this in? Oh, I guess we could do it. Oh, uh, I don't know. That one won't work that way. Oh, okay. Let me do it this way. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Do HDMI. I need HDMI? Yes. Oh, you're good, Tim. Thank you so much, man. Let's do it this way. We might just have to change the source. Shoot. So find out what happens. So what does this first commandment, though, then ask us of? Well, of the three theological virtues, what does it require? It requires love. I am the Lord your God. You shall, shall, how, you shall not have any strange gods before me. Is a God, then, you know, as I said, he's like, love for God is our absolute priority. He will accept no less. Because he gives no less. 
We've been going through this whole year, and we've seen how God, out of love for us, created us. Even when we sinned, he did not give up on us, for he came down to earth, as we've seen in Jesus, to where Jesus would give his own life for us upon the cross. Everything being offered to us of love. That this first commandment then is if we have a God who will give himself completely to us. As we say in the Diocese of Wichita, our grateful response should be to give our love back. That's the fulfillment of this first commandment then. So the love for God is our absolute priority because you're God's absolute priority. Always have been. Always will be. Even if you just c commit the worst sin, God doesn't give up. He comes running after us. And so love of God must be complete. Well, how did Jesus describe this commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The greatest commandment. To love him with your whole being. Because God loves you that way. See, this first commandment then goes deeper. Into It's just not a checking off the box, okay, today I didn't put my cell phone before God or before my wife. Sorry, I threw you underneath the bus there, Adam. <laughs> Adam's going to be upset at me later on. Um, but it is to say that, okay, where am I? I'm going to love God with everything here. And, and to share this with him. To where then, love for anything else is idolatry. That becomes just, it's that simple. If I put something before God, that becomes my idol. Because I love that. Jesus will say, you cannot serve two masters. Either you will love one and hate the other, or love the other and hate the other, uh, and, and hate the other one. You can't love both at the same time equally. And because of that then, is that if I'm going to put my job, making money, sports, activity, anything like that, before my relationship with God, then, then it becomes the idea that that's what I love. I mean, if we look at the our own calendar, and if my time for God is like way down at the bottom, I'll fit in Mass when I want to, or my own little time for prayer. If I have time tonight before I'm too tired, or so forth, then how have we made God a priority? That's the thing where it comes into is because if I, I'm loving everything else, and not God. That's what this first commandment though, ultimately is all about. So, but it's also about faith then. The first commandment requires us to nourish and protect our faith with prudence and vigilance and to reject everything that is opposed to it. Because out of love, faith enhances our love. Because what we're doing then is by faith is to know, all right, God is the one I must serve. Everything else, then, that is opposed to it, I have to reject. So, in this first commandment, not trying to know when we fail to continue learning more about God in the church, that goes against the commandment. Because, um, let me take Kayleen and uh, Adam here, that when they first met each other, they're now happily newly married couple and everything like that, but the thing is, when they first met each other, all right, I want to know this person. But the thing is, is if after a couple of dates they just stop wanting to know each other, but expect their relationship to grow, it's not going to happen. See, that's the faith here. So not trying to know, just to say, you know what, I know enough. Or even now being married, Adam's like, I know Colleen. I, we don't have to go on dates. I know who, I mean, everything. No. They're always seeking to know each other. That's faith. To grow in that. Or the refusing to believe. All those, uh, all those do who leave the true religion or who, knowing it, 
do not embrace it. So, you have those not trying to know, not trying to grow in it. You also have those who have... Now, the thing is, is this. I have to say on this too. I don't know who is not trying to know. I don't know who's refusing to believe. That's not for me to decide. Okay? So it's one where someone may go all the way through these classes here and decide, you know what, I'm, I'm not ready to become a Catholic yet. I, I can't, they're not, not refusing to believe. It's just somehow the faith has not touched their heart yet. I'm not saying that it's in there that, that's between them and God. They may be refusing to believe, they may, may not be. That's not my place to decide. But, it, the thing is, is, it is a sin if I'm refusing to believe how God is coming to act in my life, if I know it. And that's only, when I say I, I mean me personally. I can't make that statement for Dan. I can't make that statement for Kenneth or anything else. That's always going to be the individual. How am I choosing to learn? How am I growing in that? Do you ever want, you can jump in too. Uh, no, that's okay. I'm glad because I'm, you know, my gums are really hurting. Okay, no problem. Uh -huh. So with this though too comes in, so I'm just going to run you. The thing is with this first commandment, there's quite a few things to go against it. So it's not just one of those, all right, did I put this or this or this? So incredulity, ah, I can never say that word right. Can someone say that for me, that one? Incredulity. Yeah. Incredulity. Incredulity, okay. I'll take it. Um, the neglect of revealed truth or the willful refusal to assent to it. So the idea, let me just go, I mean, that's, all right, the neglect of revealed truth. That God is three persons, but one God. That has been revealed through the scriptures. But now they'll just simply say, hey, no, I am willfully refusing to assent to that. Even though Jesus has spoken that way. That would be that type of being. Now, that would also, so this would be something that you could be before baptism or after baptism. Heresy becomes something different. That is the obstinate post-baptismal denial of some truth. So it's taking this, but if I've been baptized, which must be believed with divine and Catholic faith, or it is likewise an obstinate doubting concerning the same. So, for me, even just as a priest, that if I was to come and say, you know what, I don't know if Jesus really rose from the dead then you should all call me one thing, a heretic. All right? I mean, and so if I'm, I do believe Jesus rose from the dead. Anyone watching this, I believe totally. So, but it's one note to deny the truths of the faith that I have accepted by my baptism becomes a heresy. And that goes against the first commandment. Because why? I'm not loving God. I'm loving my, either my own intellect or, or whatever is bringing me to deny this truth. An apostasy would be the total repudiation of the Christian faith. And the schism would be the refusal of submission to the Roman pontiff of, or of communion with the members of the, uh, of the church subject to him. So, in this is like to um, apostasy, I mean, would be more to also what I said of that heresy of denying Jesus rose from the dead as a type of apostasy, because that's just the whole Christian faith to deny that. The schism is the idea of knowing that, okay, Christ um, elected Peter the first pope, and thus gave, after Peter, another pope to continue to lead the church, to be his representative which we call the vicar of Christ, that to no longer be in communion with the person God has put as the leader of the church, then would cause what would be known as a schism. That falls underneath this first commandment. And then the, the last class I taught was, we talked about the schisms a little bit. Mm -hmm. so, so, that. so there's also hope, though, in the first commandment. 
Because when God reveals himself and calls him, man cannot fully respond to the divine love by his own powers. He must hope that God will give him the capacity to love him in return and to act in conformity with the commandments of charity. Now, what do I mean by that? That's a lot of words. None of you are here tonight without God's grace. God has somehow touched your heart to say, for Kenneth, I mean, you've been here from the whole beginning, so, but he's still touching your heart saying, hey, keep coming, keep coming. Same thing with you, said. Emily, just four or five weeks ago. Hey, come on, come try this out. Dan, you tonight, first time. Might be a little bit like, oh my goodness, well, this priest just keeps talking and talking and talking. He's cray cray. But it's one note that, hey, it draws us to my sponsors. I mean, even God's touching your heart to be here among us. This is all God working. And this is your compliance with the first commandment. And the thing is, is that it wasn't just, it wasn't like you're willing yourself. But rather, God's grace has touched your heart to say, hey, come closer. <clears throat> Remember our faith is not about a what or a list of rules. It's about a who. A divine person who's saying, come closer. And I'll help you to come closer. It's not like... God just sitting way back here and he looks at Adam and says, come on, dude, let's sit. No, God just like comes running up and says, can I just grab you and bring you along or so forth? I mean, that's what's happening here, that he must hope that God will give him the capacity to love him in return. That our love that goes back to God, the fulfillment of this commandment and all the commandments, is not anything we do on our own part. As if we have to like white knuckle it. It's more of us just opening up our heart and saying, Father, help me. I want to love you. And I hope that you will give me the grace to do that. And he does. So that's what this commandment will look at. Now, the thing is then, the first commandment is also concerned with sins against hope. Namely, despair and presumption. So, when we look at those two, what is despair? Man ceases to hope for his personal salvation from God, for help in attaining it, or for the forgiveness of his sins. That I have been so bad, God could never love me. That's despair. I could never be forgiven. I, I am just the scum of the earth. And God made a mistake. I mean, that's all the voice of the devil that gets us to believe that. To where we believe that lie. And now you see then how hope just diminishes. Because why would God give me grace? Why would God be calling me closer to him? And so it's then the idea, then it's like, he's not going to help me in attaining this. Or, I can't be forgiven of this. And we give up. Because that's what despair ultimately does. We give up of wanting to love God. And that goes then, as you see, against that first commandment. So it is contrary to God's goodness to his justice. For the Lord is faithful to his promises and to his mercy. He promises you on the day of your baptism, going back to that great sacrament, I have prepared a place for you in heaven. At the moment of your baptism, you belong to him. And so now with belonging to him, he is now going to say, hey, I'm going to help you. Even when Adam and Eve sinned. I mean, my goodness. You want to talk about like the perfect situation. They had perfect knowledge. Had perfect intellect, and all those things. And then all of a sudden, they do the break the only, they only have one commandment. And they broke it. And God 
<laughs> what, what was that, Christian? I, we never thought of it yeah. that way. He was just saying, yes. Yeah. Crazy. And the thing is, though, is that God didn't say, well, my goodness, you only had one. And you, I'm just giving up. I mean, these other ones are going to have ten later on. and they, they'll, It was like, he just simply said, I promise you, I will come and save you. And he fulfilled that promise. Um, just about a week ago or so, our first reading, at, um, there was a line that says, God rejoices in the conversion of a sinner. So think about that. He rejoices. That's his goodness. The devil wants us to think when we like go to confession that God's angry with you. And you're just lucky you can walk right now and haven't been struck by lightning yet. No. God, when we go right into that sacrament, rejoices. He's not angry. Because his mercy is desiring us to be brought closer to him. It's despair that makes us think we're going to be like struck with lightning and so forth. But then we have the other extreme. We have this, the extreme of presumption. There's two kinds of presumption. Man presumes upon his own capacities, hoping to be able to save himself without help from on high. So what does this mean that I can get to heaven by myself? And watch me, God, I'm going to do it. I don't, no, no, don't help me, God. I'm going to try to do this myself. There was a heretic that uh, way back in the early church that taught this. His name was Pelagius. And so Pelagius thought that, hey, we're the ones who have to do all the work. God just kind of just says, watches up there and says, hey, well, as if we're trying to present a present to God to say, look what I did. And thing is, is every present we give to God is all because of God's grace. Now, so there's that type of presumption that it's all put upon me. Or then there, man presumes upon God's almighty power or his mercy. So hoping to obtain his forgiveness without conversion and without glory or merit. Or without, uh, like, without conversion and glory without merit. So what do we mean by that? Is for those who I mean, this is oftentimes when I was growing up, um, and again, this might be a little bit of a generalization, but I mean, some of my uh, Protestant friends would simply say, well, you just go to confession and then people just go and get drunk that night. I mean, and so I'm not saying, and the thing is, is there would be some Catholics who would do that. And the thing is, is that, but the thing, that's not a true conversion. If you're intending to go do it, like, you can't just walk into the confessional and simply say, um, here's my sins, but I'm going to go do this anyway. You have to at least try. Now, you're going to fall over and over and over again to sins. That doesn't mean you're committing the sin of presumption. Because you're trying. That's the thing. You're trying not to sin. But you know what? There are sins that... Um, I'm just trying to think of a, I mean, like, for, I mean, with my brothers, I get frustrated at them. I get angry. I mean, and that frustration that leads to anger. And it's not a just anger. And it's like, dang it, I got to do better at that. All right, I go to confession. Christmas time comes around again. I get angry at them again when they come back home. And it's one like, oh, I keep falling to this. But it's not that I'm not trying. It's when we're going to say, well, I'll be forgiven anyway, or I'll just go to confession later on uh, and, and have this forgiven, that that's when we're presuming. That would be the same thing with married couples, though, too, right? If they get mad at each other sometimes. It's the same with, like, you, oh. you and your brother. It, anyway, yeah. I mean, it can be with any sin. I mean, it um, could be, let, let's just take when you were mentioning uh, missing mass. You know, you might be in that habit of missing mass, and you're like, oh, dang it, i got to get back. So you go back for one week, then two weeks, and then you just oversleep one weekend. All right, well, you were trying. So you go, you go back to confession. You be, it's not like you're presuming it. But if there was this thought, it was like, you know, I'll just keep missing, keep missing, because at some point I'll just go to confession. And, no, we, we have that conversion of hearts. Now, sometimes it... 
it takes a little while. So that's where don't um, think, though, either that, man, if I keep falling to this sin, then I'm not really having a conversion. No, as long as you just you keep trying and wanting to, then there becomes that uh, you're not falling into presumption. How do, Does that uh, make sense? Yeah. Go ahead. Like, because uh, you're talking about sin, like with action, what about like thoughts? Like, somebody, like, you can have sinful thoughts, right? And so. Okay. Uh, the, uh, cause, uh, you know, like, oh, I was thinking about that, contemplating some of this stuff, you know, and it's easy to find your actions. Sometimes thoughts are uncontrollable or you have, you know, yes. pop into your heads. Exactly. So, when looking at, um, when we're going about sin here, is, I wish I had a little board up here on this. Um, we, we're looking at kind of two things, acts of man and human acts, okay? So acts of man, I'm sorry to get into a lot of just uh, theology type of thing. Acts of man is like breathing. So you can't sin while breathing. You cannot sin while sleeping. Because you are not, I mean, those are just normal human acts. So um, if... Tim and his wife are sleeping and everything like that, and he's there, and he just absents to clock his wife upside the head as he rolls over. Not a sin. The other way around, though. Okay. She actually does. Do that. But so you have there is that because that was just totally accidental. Whereas it's totally different if they're both awake and one of them clocks the other one, and everything is like, oh, uh, yeah, you were choosing that. So that would be the acts of man part. Now human acts is where we have to look at three things. One, what is the object? Is the object good or bad? Secondly, what are the circumstances that is causing this? Thirdly, what's the intention behind it? Now, so you bring up thoughts. So, I cannot control my brain at all. I mean, things will just pop in, pop out, and so forth. Now. But the question becomes is when it pops in, um, the idea of, um, oh, let's see, I, I'm just, I'm just going to go bluntly here. When I was in seminary, I remember watching the Super Bowl, and there was these two ladies out there just kind of like dancing all over the place. I mean, it was a commercial for 30 seconds. And I'm like, I mean, just dancing almost like in a bikini or something like that. And all of a sudden, it comes up, Pepsi, drink it. And we're all like, what the heck did that have to do with Pepsi? But it got into my mind. Now, in that, though, it's like I can be sitting in class the next week or the next month, and boom, in there pops that lady dancing around. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I don't want this. So by me saying that, I don't want this. And maybe then at that moment, I just simply say, Jesus and Mary, please take this thought away. All right? Now, I don't want it. I've made this little prayer. So my will, my intel, I mean, is everything, my intention is not to dwell on. Doesn't mean the thought's gone away yet. All right? It's sort of like, you know, I had a priest one time tell me, it's sort of like a leaf. The thing is, is the more you keep looking at that leaf, the more you get fixated on. You might be stopping the leaf from moving but and everything, but sometimes, so we do that with our thoughts, especially in, um, and I'm just going to speak now more for guys because we're wired this way, is you have that guy, I mean, that image of that girl, she's in my, I, I don't want this, so I try to start pushing it out. It's like fire. And the more I keep trying to push it out, it just gets heat, getting stronger. And so as it gets stronger, then I'm now worried, I'm like, Oh my goodness, I must be dwelling on it because it's in my mind longer. <clears throat> well, no. It's just the fact that we're not tackling it in the right way. By just simply relaxing and just simply saying, I don't want this thought. I make this short little prayer. And now let me treat it as a leaf being blown by in the wind. Because I ignore those. <clears throat> and, and to where, you know, it may, it may just kind of linger in there. But I'm not really thinking about it. I'm not devoting my energy to it. Don't so, entertain the thought. Yeah, if you, and that's if you what, entertain it and keep entertaining it. That's bad. But but the hard part becomes is is the definition of entertaining. 
Because entertaining, sometimes people think, because it lingered in my mind for two, three minutes, then I must have been entertained. Not necessarily. It's when I, so the entertaining here is when I am finding pleasure in it. Whether it be a lustful thought, whether it be a thought of anger. So I get wronged by this person, and so I start thinking, how am I going to get back? And, and it may be, oh, here's a nice little subtle way to do it when it's really passive aggressive. And so, and, and that part, that would be in there of what, like Tim said, of entertaining the thought to say, hey, well, how can I get back at this person? So it doesn't have to deal necessarily with lust. Or like judging other, yeah, judging, you know. yeah. So a, ju a thought of judgment comes to mind. So what I, just a little helpful thing I try to do is, because honestly that judgment is coming from the devil, and the last thing the devil then would want me to do is say a prayer for the person. So it might be at that moment, and that person may get underneath my skin too. So that might, that becomes a good act of charity that I pray for someone that I'm really not liking. And so, and it might be, all right, I need to pray a Hail Mary if I have that time. Or it may be, Jesus and Mary, please be with that person. Not as a way of judgment, but as a way of just show them your love. So that now I've redirected that, that thought about that person to become a prayer for that person. And if we get into those habits, they'll start to, I mean, the devil's going to find a different way to attack you. So... Great question. So it does depend on, I mean, when we're, thoughts get a little bit more, uh, have, have a little bit more ambiguity to it. Like I, Jesus, Jesus said, those who committed adultery, you know, if you think about lust in your, you've mm -hmm. already committed adultery, if you think about it too much. There is, but I mean, but again, the ambiguity is what is too much, what is, and right. so forth. Well, you know, I was thinking like in terms like, I'm worshiping, you know, false. Like if you're thinking, I don't need any more money, or I need, you know, I'm not making enough. What, you know, there's things like that you think of that can be interpreted as like ambitious, but it could also be you're fixated on something like mm -hmm. that too, and it could turn you know, sinful. It seems like you know. the the part comes to there. Then I would always go back to is, are you controlling your money, yeah. or does the money control you? And, and for example, is man, all right, I have this much money saved up, but. I'm not going to go out to eat uh, or take my girlfriend or so forth out to eat because I want to save more money. Well, now that money is now more controlling you than it's being used as a tool to be in relationship with others. So that's the kind of the re rewiring then of our thinking um, and our mentality. So lastly, though, with the first commandment, the first commandment enjoins us to love God above everything. We, we saw that at the beginning and all creatures for him and because of him. So, what goes against love is the hatred of God that is pride. That was Satan's whole thing. Why did Satan get kicked out of heaven? Because he wanted to be equal to God. And thus, St. Michael comes, whose name means, who is like God, and kicks Satan out of heaven. And so then there becomes no indifference. That is, it neglects or refuses to reflect upon, uh, reflect on divine charity. That, all right, God loves me, but eh, who cares? That can become that mindset. There's also ingratitude. So fails to re or refuses to acknowledge divine charity and to return him love for love. So... God does these great things for us, and we don't do anything to show our things back. Um, this is where, again, I'm not saying it's a uh, sin, but a great practice, just to, sh to practice that gratitude, is when you receive Holy Communion, take the time just to say just two simple words. Thank you. I mean, I remember sitting at my mom's dinner table, every, and she, even now as an adult, we sit there, and when we're finished with the meal, we would always say, we couldn't leave the dinner table as kids until we said, thank you, Mom, for the meal. Because she took the time to do that. When we look at the Eucharist, God's providing himself. So to go back, at, once you have received communion, to go back into your pew and just simply to say, Lord, thank you for letting me receive you. 
You are now inside of me. And we are close together. Um, so that would be that sign of gratitude. Lukewarmness. That is hesitation or negligence in responding to divine love. It can imply refusal to give oneself over to the promptings of charity. So this is where, you know, like when you were saying, Kenneth, about like money, that you, you kind of feel this prompting to go and give some money to the Lord's diner. Because you know, hey, people have fallen into hard times. I've got some extra money. I could help them so that they can have food and so forth. But you never do. So you're feeling this prompting, but it's kind of like, mm, no. So that's what we would call also a sin of commission. I mean, what I should have done, but I failed to do because that was the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But it also comes about in this way of what we call a lukewarmness. That, yeah, I follow God, but I'm not fully all in to him yet. I'm not ready to follow everything he asks. Um, to where... If I may say, one of the most um, poignant views of the sin of lukewarmness is given by Jesus himself in the book of Revelation. When he simply says, how I wish you were either hot or cold. For if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. That is, I will barf you up. Now, I don't mean to, here, here's the thing. You guys being present here tonight, you're not lukewarm. I, at least I don't view you that way. Again, I can't be your judge. But the thing is, is by being here, is saying that, you know what, there's something touching your heart. That's why you've come here tonight. So you've followed that prompting. Can other parts of your heart be inflamed more? Yes, so can mine. Oh, trust me. There's areas of my heart that still need to be touched by the fire of God's love. There's parts of it that, at times, I fall into this. And thus, I do go to confession and say, yeah, I didn't follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. I, I, matter of fact, I mean, I hate to say my last confession, but my last confession, I actually did confess this along the lines. I said, I felt God's grace, and I didn't react to it. And that's that lukewarmness. So I'm not proud to have to say that, but it happens. And so, But that's where God's mercy comes in. There's spiritual sloth then. And so it goes so far as to refuse the joy that comes from God and to be repelled by divine goodness. That we're just like, you know what? No, I'm just, I'm done praying. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to enter into this communion with God. I don't want his love. And that one, though, get, becomes a really hard to fathom, but it does happen. And that's where we seek to overcome it. So other sins, though, against it, superstition, as we talked about idolatry, that is polytheism, multiple gods, serving mammon and not God, making uh, dress, money, honor, society, company, or pleasure our God, giving up the worship of God and sinning for their sake and thus making them God. So also divination and magic. So, has recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. One attempts to tame occult powers, so as to place them at the service and have a supernatural power over others. Wearing charms is also reprehensible. So, Ouija boards, definitely against the faith. And when I say the faith, that means all Christianity, all right? So whether or not, I mean, that's the thing here. It's not one or the other. It's like, hey, if you're a true Christian, you're going to have that. On, on some of those, it, it, you, have to, you have to know what it is. Like, there's a lot of those, it seems like those symbols and jewelry and things like that. I, I wouldn't know what they were. You'd have to have full knowledge. Full knowledge. You'd have yes. Full knowledge of what it was. Yeah. You have to be wearing it, right? Yeah. As I mentioned, all this, this is underneath the pretext that you have full knowledge of it. If you don't have full knowledge, you you're not. Now, it still unfortunately can have an effect on you because that doesn't stop Satan from working on you. But your culpability for it becomes a lot less. 
Because remember, you have to have full knowledge, free will, and know that is gravely really wrong just to have a mortal sin. You have to have full knowledge just to enter into sin. So, um, the irreligion, that is tempting God, putting his goodness and almighty power to the test by word or deed. Um, this one can be in there as like bartering with God. So, kind of like making these deals. Hey, God, if you do this, I'll do this. Um, sacrilege, profaning or treating un unworthily the sacraments and other liturgical actions, as well as persons, things, or places consecrated to God. Also, simony, the buying or selling of spiritual things. So, I cannot sell... Um, how would I put that? I cannot sell the Eucharist to you. That's nothing to be bought. Uh, I can't even sell blessings. I can't charge to go to confession. As, I mean, if to say like to Sonia, oh, Sonia, that one's going to be $20 for me to forgive. <laughs> no. Freely I have been given. Freely I must give it away. And so we have those things here. Now the thing is, is this. I do want you to understand. You know, you may be looking, I mean, as I've gone through so many of them, you're like thinking, well, Father, I did this one. I had to have done this too. And everything. It can be forgiven. All right? None of these sins are beyond God's mercy. Yes? Uh, quick question. I, it, about like the superstition one. Mm -hmm. So like, people look for signs in nature. Not necessarily like, like uh, like trying to conjure them, but like mm -hmm. seeing a bird or you know like a wind or whatever, is that superstition or does that mean or is you know what I mean? It's kind of like borderline, maybe I guess. Well, the thing is, is yeah, we're not really ever to pray for signs, right? Because the enemy can be a part of that too. Mm -hmm. He can uh, interact in that. Um, but what I will say is this: is that. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, uh, he has what is called the 14 rules of spiritual discernment. That there's always two things always acting upon us. The good spirit, God. The bad spirit, the devil. And in that is, as it's working upon us, sometimes it's like, all right, we have to learn to discern who it is acting on us. So you can kind of take the same thing like in nature, it's like, not to run like, oh, this was a huge sign. That I gotta go do this. Um, for example, um, when I remember one time being at a wedding of my cousin, standing there in the church with right next to my mom and dad, my cousin comes walking down, and the first thing I think of, man, it'd be cool to be the priest at this wedding. And I had no thought right at that time of entering the seminary. So would I call that a sign? Yes. But, do I have to discern it even more so? Of whether or not, all right, so there was something there. God's trying to tug at my heart. But it doesn't mean, ooh, i got to run and I need to pray on this. I need to find an, uh, someone who knew far more than I did and share that and say, hey, how do I, how do I continue to discern it and to know it? So does that make sense? Yep. Am I answering? Yep, thanks. Along that line. So, I mean, there can be things in nature, but... It's one where, all right, how do I discern this and bring other uh, people who can help me to discern it? Someone like who's of it, if it's good or bad, kind yeah. of like, makes sense. So any other questions? I've got to get through two more commandments. You, you think, man, three commandments, this is going to be short class. This is why I have to break these three commandments. These go all by itself. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So what do you think on this one? I've been talking about what 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 do you think this would be about? Disruptive. Isn't it damning somebody? Like it's not necessarily cussing, but it's like, like I hope God, you know what's you. Okay. It could be that. What else? Don't speak of him irreverently. Okay. Just just quite blankly, blankly, it's like don't don't ever just use his name uh, casually. His name is something holy. Um. So, that is in vain, without necessity. So, like tonight, I mean, I, I've referred to Jesus. I refer, 
But that's out of necessity to show forth his great love and his concern and love for you. But if I'm sitting around playing cards and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, and I say the name then, that's not out of necessity. So that becomes the difference there. So what's our responsibility then in this second, in this commandment? Love of God, because that's what we're looking at in the commandments, demands that we respect his sacred name. What is holy. But this respect is also extended to Mary, the mother of God, and the saints. So, I'm going to go back up to this first one and then show how it comes into this one. This first one. When you're ever at Mass, and Father Matt or myself, or you watch any other priest, according to what we call the rubrics of how to help pray the Mass, anytime I will say the name Jesus or use the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I will bow my head. Every time that name comes up, I hear Jesus, I bow the head. So if I'm saying the prayers... And it comes to it to um, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, it's almost to where now. I mean, I, I I just do it naturally to where I hear that name because why do I bow the head? Because it's a sign of I want to humble myself just even to that name. Now, at mass as well, when Mary is mentioned, our head gets bowed. My head goes bowed as well. Because she was that perfect disciple who always received God's love and returned love back to God. She fulfilled every one of the commandments. And so, but also then the saints, because now they're in that perfect relationship of love in heaven where I long to be. And so promises made to others in God's name engage the divine honor, fidelity, truthfulness, and authority. <laughs> So, in this, that, you know what, to say, you know what, I promise on God's name I'm going to do this. Then you better do it. That's why Jesus says, you know what, it's, don't ever promise on the name of heaven or on God's throne or so forth. Because what you're promising on is something so holy, if you do not fulfill it, you're taking God's name in vain. Now, to say, hey, I promise I'll do this for you. That's not on the promising on, on God's name. So there's a difference of those levels of promises, okay? So I'm not, so just saying to someone, hey, um, again, taking Adam and Colleen since they're right up here, easy fodder right now, that Adam says, hey, I promise tonight I'll, I'll take the trash out. He falls asleep. Colleen wakes up the next morning. Trash is still there. She has to take it out. Did he sin? Well, maybe a little just because nothing big. I mean, he just didn't show that full respect to his wife. But did he sin against God's name? No. Because he didn't say, hey, I promise on God I will do I mean, no. Because we don't make those types of promises just in case. I mean, he may have been just truly exhausted. Accidentally falls asleep. So, because, but what are we doing? We're engaging divine honor. And God's fidelity, his truthfulness and authority. So, when we're looking at a sacred name, God calls each one by name, so every name is sacred. That becomes the interesting thing here. Every name in this room is sacred. So, kind of like, I mean, Christian just walked off. Um, if I was to say to Devin, and I'm, just jo I'm not meaning this seriously, those watching, Devin, go to hell. is I am now damning that name to a place where no one should ever want to go. And so I am showing disrespect to Devin. But you also have to remember, too, is that a name is the icon of the person. You know, I could ask you, you guys to close your eyes, and I could mention a name Mark. And each of you would have a different person probably pop into your head. 
because that's that icon, that's that name, that name elicits that person. I think of my brother immediately because that's what it's called in there. And so that, that name is always in a way of referring to a person who is the temple of God. So it's saying Devin. That's referring to that unique person, that temple of God. And so that's what I was getting at there. The name is the icon of the person. And thus, it demands respect as a sign of the dignity of the one who bears it. So, to gossip goes against the good name of a person. Even though they may not be there. They may not be in that conversation because, let's face it, they're not because we never gossip in front of a person. They're never there. But what are we doing? We're taking that icon of that person and in some way slandering it, distorting it of what it really should be. So that goes against the second commandment. And so we're... One thing is that you'll see, so that right there um, is a type of gossip or slander or so forth. It goes against the second commandment. As you will see later on, you can even put that underneath the fifth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. One would say, well, Father, no, the person's still alive. You're killing their reputation. To where that person now sees them. In the back of their mind, they're thinking what they've heard from you. And so the dignity of that person is all, I mean, I, I just remember my mom always simply saying, if you have nothing good to say, don't say it at all. I still need to learn that a lot better. My mom is so wise. I wish she would watch these videos, see all my kudos I give her. <laughs> so what else would this be, though? Sin, so against it, profane words. That is bad, but especially irreverent and irreligious words. That is cursing and swearing. Or also false oaths. Swearing a thing is true or false without knowing for certain whether it is or not. So frivolous oath-taking and, as we all know, perjury would be a huge one against it. Blasphemy is not the same as cursing or taking God's name in vain. It is worse. It is to say or do something very disrespectful to God. To say that he is unjust, cruel, or the like is to blaspheme. We can blaspheme also in actions. To defy God by a sign or an action. To dare him to strike us dead, etc. Would be to blaspheme. To say, I mean, in a way, this is tempting God, but this is also blaspheming. If I was to say, you know what? God, you have to stop this from hitting the ground or you don't exist. That's blasphemy. To say, I mean, that I'm going to say, hey, you have to buy this action. Prove yourself to me. That's why I won't drop that. Because that would not be good. All right. So we, have, we got into this a little bit already. So... Third commandment, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Tim did a great job of just talking about, hey, this requires us to go to Mass. But I want to just go into it. It's like, by the third commandment, we are commanded to keep holy the Lord's day and the holy days of obligation on which we are to give our time to the service and worship of God. So it's not just... Sundays. Now we have to also look at it this way. We now call it the Sabbath is still a command of God. And so attendance at Mass is not only an obligation of worship, but one of love. And is not a chore. That's the big thing. Yeah, right now we don't have, uh, well, right now we have a dispensation, a general dispensation. But the thing is, is this. If you're going out to eat, if you're visiting different restaurants, going to the going to little like get-togethers with people and so forth, but not going to a mass because there's a dispensation, 
yeah, you're not falling into that whole system. But the thing is, is, what I would say is a deeper concern for me is that we're not doing this out of love then. That if I'm willing to go over to um, friends' houses or go out to eat to be around all these other people, but I won't then, though, because I've got a dispensation right now, go to Mass because, hey, it's not technically an obligation. I can't sin. But the thing is, though, it's more about, all right, where, where's my relationship with God? Because I want to be with Him. And He wants to be with me. So we look at this as a command. And I remember as a kid, I, went to, I one time said to my parents, I said, man, I have to go to Mass. And my mom and dad looked and said, no, no, no. You get to go to Mass. This is an opportunity to love. Not meant to be a chore. Yeah, sometimes you don't feel like going. But you know what? Sometimes you don't feel like going to work either. But you know what? You have to go pay the bills. Thing is, because why? I love my family. That's why I go to work. I want to be able to provide for them. Well, all right. Man, this pillow feels really nice on a Sunday morning. But you know what, Lord? I want to go out of love for you. I may not feel like it, but love isn't always doing what we feel like. It's just doing what is right at that moment. And so, Mass, as we've talked about already uh, with Father Matt, so I won't take too long with this, it is the heart of the church's life. We celebrate the Paschal Mystery. Uh, it is in the light of the apostolic tradition, as we've gone over it many other times. And it's the primary prayer of the church. I thought Father Matt did a great job in explaining that. So the Sabbath, though, because if and I, I go old school, um, as, uh, my, when I do the commandments, uh, you shall keep holy um, the Sabbath day. So it's almost change it to the Lord's day. Either way is fine. But what do we mean, though, is that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, which is made for us and not we for it. That the Sabbath has been given to us as a gift to rest. And so Sunday has become the Christian Sabbath. For Jews... It's Saturday. For us, it's the Sunday. So why Sunday? First and foremost, day of resurrection. Jesus rises from the dead. Big thing to celebrate. Huge. Enormous. It's like, all right, God dies. He comes back to life. Yeah, I'm celebrating that. It's also the new creation. It's the eighth day in which we are now starting over. So creation itself, how many days did it go? Zach? Seven. seven. So what did God do on the seventh day? Rested. He rested. And so when we had fallen, the eighth day, the day of the resurrection is, I've recreated you now. I'm reestablished. And so we're in this eighth day with it. And so it is the fulfillment of the Sabbath that we can rest in God's recreation. So we have that there. Now, there's holy days of obligation. So these are days in the church that don't fall on Sunday, but are, um, for lack of better words, a requirement that in a way kind of demands our love in a special way. Now, one thing is this, um, Easter, not a holy day of obligation. One may say, uh, Father, that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. The exact, and everything. Why is that? Because it falls on Sunday. You have to go anyway. Okay, so any of them that fall on Sundays are not holy days of obligation. If they fall, because Sunday you have to go anyway. So, looking at the calendar, I'm just going to go from January all the way through December 31st. Mary, Mother of God, January 1st, Holy Day of Obligation. Now, growing up for me, I always thought we just went on Mass on the Holy Day of Obligation uh, on January 1st because that was just the best way to start the new year anyway. I mean, that's the way Mom and Dad always said, 
hey, we're starting a new year. You started this out with God. Started out the right way. Come later on to find out is dedicated to Mary as the mother of God and so forth. And I was like, oh, all right, this makes even more sense. Even though their, their logic made sense to me too. So then we get to go all the way to August 15th to the next Holy Day of Obligation. So we go all the way that long. One when they say, well, Father, wait a second. Why isn't Ash Wednesday out there? It's the start of Lent. No, nope, not a Holy Day of Obligation. Even though you get ashes and all those things, and it's good to start Lent out with Mass, it's not a requirement. One may say, well, what about Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and uh, the whole Paschal mystery of the Triduum? The thing is, is honestly, it's not a Holy Day of Obligation, simply because, the way it was always explained to me is, it's the holiest days of the year. There's no more days more holy than those three days of the Triduum. And it's almost as if the church is like, we don't have to make this required because we hope by now you realize how important these days are and you wouldn't want to miss just out of love that Jesus would give himself at the Last Supper in the Eucharist. He goes and dies for us on Good Friday. And then we wait for it uh, on Holy Saturday in anticipation for Sunday's resurrection. So that would, So we don't even have that. Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, 50 days later. Oh, that falls on Sunday. So, not on there as well. So, we go through all these things. So, for our calendar, and here in the United States, the Assumption of Mary would be our next Holy Day of Obligation, August 15th. Then, All Saints Day. So, uh, real quick though, too, back on the Assumption of Mary. What does that mean? I mean, because I don't want to just kind of run through it as if to uh, imply that you all know it. When she was brought into heaven. When she was brought into heaven. How? I mean, what was brought into heaven? Body and soul. Her whole body and soul. So that's what's different between her and the other saints. St. Peter, his soul's in heaven. His body has not been taken up yet. Any other saint you want to name? Their soul's in heaven, but not their body. So they're waiting for their body to be reunited. That's when the human person is fully then brought into the beatific vision. Whereas Mary, because she was taking body and soul into heaven, she is the fulfillment of what we will all become when Jesus comes on the last day. Our souls may be already in heaven, but our souls are still waiting to be reunited with our bodies uh, in that time. So, All Saints Day. We think of all those saints who are in heaven, those we know and those we don't know. Um, you went through this all before, too. I just want to review, uh, review this again. So, Sarah did a great job with this as well. But just a reminder, so, because this falls underneath that third commandment. How are we going to keep these days holy? How do we make that time? And that's why... On the Holy Days of Obligation, I make sure I have at least like five Masses. It wears me out and Father Matt. I think Father Matt's like, oh my goodness. So I get this day over with. I mean, so, but <laughs> I'm right there with him. It, it exhausts us, but we want to give every opportunity. Immaculate Conception, December 8th. Does anyone know what that is? When Mary was conceived, wasn't it? It is when Mary was conceived. Oh, sorry. So, no, you're good. Is that what you're going to say, Zach? Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, oftentimes we have the reading of uh, Gabriel coming to Mary and she conceiving Jesus, on, and so that's what's always the reading is on December eighth. And I remember, uh, if I've already shared this before, I'm sorry, but I remember walking home. I was a junior in high school. We had just gone to mass, and I looked at my mom. I said, "Mom, I don't get this." She says, "What?" I said. Either A, Mary had the shortest pregnancy ever of 17 days <laughs> to December 25th, or the longest one ever of 382 days. Which one is it? And she says, what are you talking about? I said, Mary conceives Jesus. And she looks at me and she says, you idiot. She says, that has nothing to do. Jesus didn't get conceived. It's Mary being conceived without sin. I'm like, what? And I was like, well, why don't we read that reading? And she says, because of the angel's greeting, when the angel says, Hail, full of grace. 
To be full of grace means to be without sin. So thus she had to be conceived without sin. That's what the Immaculate Conception means. So it's not just only, though, to, to add to Christian's thing. Mary being conceived, yes, but conceived without any sin. And then lastly, Christmas. Holy Day of the Obligation. But that one's always easy. Everyone wants to go on Christmas Day. So we have that there. And anything else? Yes. Keeping holy the Lord's Day is an attitude that must affect every act on Sunday. The third commandment forbids all unnecessary servile work and whatever else may hinder the due observance of the Lord's day. So what do we mean by this? First of all, servile. That is, work which was formerly done by the slaves. Therefore, writing, reading, studying, etc. are not servile. So any like kids or anything that you ever have, and they say, oh, I can't work on Sunday, so I can't study. Oh, no, 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 no. Studying is perfectly allowed because it's uh, engaging your mind. So if your kids ever tell you something like that, you can throw me out and just say, nope, it doesn't work that way. Um, because they were not the works of the slaves. So what is the works of that? I mean, and I'm sorry if anyone's offended by using the word slaves. I don't mean anything bad in that part. But like, would be trying to refrain from doing laundry that day. Um... Try not to do any unnecessary shopping. So, like going, like, hey, we can make a Walmart trip at another time. Um, try, because those are things that we're trying not to do that would be really kind of unnecessary. Um, but yet there is necessity types of work. So firemen endeavoring to extinguish a fire, sailors working on a ship at sea, those things have to happen. Um, Dan, with your line of duty, you get sent out on, um, oh, shoot, man, the words, um, I want to, what is it called in the military? Tell me, Jesse, too. Deployment. Deployment, thank you, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> and they tell you that, like, all right, you're going to have to go out on a patrol at, on, on Sunday. It's not like you can say, oh, no, no, can't do it. You, you go do it. That's a part that becomes a necessity. So there you are not breaking the commandment. So, um, doctors who get called in to do an emergency surgery, not breaking the commandment. So, that's where that necessity comes in. Questions? So, on that one, yeah. uh, this is kind of splitting hairs a little bit, but, so like mowing the lawn. Okay. So, I figured that would come up. I know. And, and I really, I almost feel bad about even saying it. Sorry, Justin. So, I on one doing, hand, I I do on, uh, on one hand, I feel a little bad maybe when I make the kids do it. But for myself, I find it rather relaxing. Mm -hmm. And it's not a chore. But it is necessary because the grass is long, right? So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Just random thoughts that, you know. It's, 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 I know there's a lot of gray area. But no, there is. And here's the thing I will say on this is um, in all of these things too, I am not the arbitrator and judge of your soul either. So it's between you and God on something. I mean, I will go so far as to say, it's between you and God on that one. But if you're, you cannot trick God if you're like, man, I don't want to go mow the lawn, but I got to get, this is the only time I can get it done, type, da, 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 type sure. of thing. Sure. Then, yeah, you're kind of doing it more servile. Um, because I mean, Take someone, though, too, who likes to plant flowers. And, they, I mean, that's just really relaxing. It's, it's sort of like their way of running. Um, because that of, I mean, we would say, hey, if you're going to go and uh, kind of work out just to get some exercise in on a Sunday or go for, like, a bike ride as a family, I mean, that definitely is not going against it because that's promoting family time and so forth. Um, but if this person's like, hey, I like, I mean, just to work out there in nature um, and to really kind of participate with God in that um, as long as they're being authentic sure. in that type of attitude mm -hmm. then yeah I, I could go along with that okay. um, now because I don't think we can go full full um, oh what I would say almost pharisaical of that sure 
Um, and but that, but also though being balanced, it, it's sort of like for me with laundry. I don't enjoy laundry, matter of fact, because one of the things I hate doing is folding it when it's all done anyway. Amen. And so in that, um, I know Adam loves folding. I mean, that's his biggest thing. But um, that's what happens when I do marriage prep with him. He's just out. Fun. I love folding laundry. I love doing it on Sundays. Just let me fold more clothes and everything. I hate it. So. I have made myself, I mean, yeah, would it be easier for me on a Sunday? I get done with the 11 o'clock mass and go home, put a lunch together and be like, man, I, I got a load up there. Let me throw that in there. Go take a nap, come down, throw it in the dryer, do the, get it done on a Sunday afternoon, nice and neat. Yeah, but I hate doing it. And yeah, I'm doing some kind of thing that's servile. So I would be for myself breaking the commandments in that. So you could also offer it up though. Yeah. Just, I'm just, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Father. No, Bruce. I would say you can't. <laughs> I'm just throwing no. something out there. No. I, I think with the grass, there is a, a solution here. They have these new, very reasonably priced lawnmowers or little robots. And they do it all for you. That's called a goat. That's what I'm saying about the work machine. It does it for you. No. <laughs> They cut your lawn. I, I mean, I'm saying no. It's, washing machine may do it, but you still have to fold it. And I hate folding clothes. So I know I. So um, the suffering, I mean, yeah, you can say, hey, I'm going to offer this up. Now, I will take this, Christian. So let's take it with. Um, we get a bad snowstorm that comes in Saturday night, and the next door neighbor in their 70s. And when your kids are older and everything, you say, hey, go over and shovel the sidewalk for her. And they're like, it's Sunday, Dad. No. That'd be, that's now an act of charity. And, but then you're telling them, too, you got to go shovel it, and you can't get paid for it. Yeah. I mean, so I would say that. It's like slavery, kind of. So, um, because you're doing it for the, charity always chumps everything. So if you're good doing it for the good of your neighbor in that case, that, hey, I'm seeking to help this person out because, you know what, they, they need their sidewalk cleaned so they don't slip and fall. Then that's charity trumps in that case. And you're not doing it to be paid. You're not doing anything yeah, like that. That makes so. sense. All right, great. Any other questions? And don't you can go to mass on Saturday night, and that counts for Sunday, right? That's a great observation there, Kenneth. Yes, because according to our um, Jewish brothers and sisters, the next day begins at sundown. So now we define sundown, though, at a certain time, that is being 4 o'clock, um, so that it's uniform in knowing, all right, when would we categorize sundown? So 4 o'clock, I mean, the sun may be still up if you're coming to mass, but it does, I mean, it is in that what we call the anticipation of the next day with the sundown. That comes from uh, our Jewish heritage. Excellent. So Saturday night mass is actually considered a Sunday mass. So to fulfill your Sunday obligation comes from that. Sorry, I did a lot of talking. I'm sorry. I oh, I overtook your whole lesson. Uh, I'm so sorry. Holidays of obligation are different in different countries. They are. Mm -hmm. So... They will all, I mean, we were in Italy in January. We had to, we had to go to the Epiphany Mass. Mm -hmm. And then when we came back to the States, it fell on the Sunday after we got back. So then we obviously we have to go again. Well, in some states, even in the United States, there's a, there's a couple of them that go differently. But that, I wouldn't worry too much about that right now. Um, well, guys, thank you. Normally, I, I would leave you guys time for discussion questions. But I just threw this all up together. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great night, guys.